If it's Monday, bipartisan agreement and bipartisan outrage. President Biden throws his support behind the Senate's newly released border deal. As former President Donald Trump renews his strong opposition, and Speaker Mike Johnson again declares it dead on arrival in the House. Plus, more signs of trouble for Democrats as the president's poll numbers take another dive in our latest NBC News poll, with voters saying they trust Trump over Biden on nearly every major issue and new strikes and new concerns of a widening conflict. U.S. officials warned that the retaliation campaign against Iran-backed militants isn't over and that strikes inside Iran aren't off the table. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Yami Shalsender reporting in Washington, where President Biden's political standing, coupled with the urgency of getting aid to Ukraine and Israel, has apparently made him willing to agree to the most conservative border deal in modern history. The bipartisan deal was announced late yesterday after weeks of negotiations, and within hours, House Republicans vowed to kill it. That's how confident they appear to be in former President Trump's political standing on this issue ahead of November. The $20 billion border deal is part of a larger $118 billion national security package. The agreement forces the administration to shut down the border if migrant encounters reach a certain numbers. And it toughens requirements for asylum claims and raises the credible fear standard. The bill is a major shift to the right for President Biden, but even as some Democrats are blasting the deal, some Republicans are, too. As we said, House leadership calls it dead on arrival. House Speaker Mike Johnson said the bill is, quote, even worse than we expected. Top Republican negotiator Senator James Langford reacted to those comments last night. I'm a little confused how it's worse than I expected when it builds border wall, expands deportation flights, expands ICE officers, border patrol officers, de uh, detention beds, uh, how it creates a faster process for deportation. Uh, how it uh, uh, clears up a lot of the long-term issues and loopholes uh, that have existed in the asylum law and then gives us an emergency authority that stops the chaos right now on the border. Killing the bill all but guarantees the crisis at the border remains an issue during the 2024 election cycle. And <laughs> that might be the point. Former President Trump has been blasting the bill on social media. He called it a, quote, trap and urged Republicans to block it. House Republicans are instead focusing their efforts on impeaching the country's top immigration official. The House Rules Committee is meeting right now to officially consider impeaching DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. A full House vote is expected tomorrow on Meet the Press Now or on Meet the Press Sunday. Kristen Welker asked Speaker Johnson how impeachment addresses the border crisis. How does impeaching Mayorkas do anything to address the immediate crisis at the border, which you have called a catastrophe, which you said deserves immediate attention? Kristen, for that matter, how does passing a new law by Congress do anything to solve the catastrophe that they have intentionally designed and created? The, the president problem expanded is you have an abject failure on of asylum. leadership. It, it, it does a <laughs> but range the president of different is not things using the authorities he has right now. All right. No, Kristen, me, the president ahead, and Mayorkas are not using the authorities they have right now. NBC News was the first to report President Biden's most forceful condemnation of the impeachment efforts yet. Today, in a statement, the White House condemned the effort as, quote, an unprecedented and unconstitutional political attack. All of this comes as our new NBC News poll shows President Biden with an enormous 35-point deficit to Trump on the question of who is better off the border. And as President Biden faces his worst overall job approval numbers yet. NBC Sahil Kapoor is on Capitol Hill with the latest on the future of the bill. With me on set, it's NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haake, who's been following the Trump campaign's reaction to this bill. And NBC News' is Julia Ainsley, who has all the insight on this bill and what it would do. So, Sahil, I want to start with you. We finally, finally, finally got the text of this bill last night. House Republican leadership, though, as we said, says it's dead on arrival, killing it, really. Um, where do things stand now? What are we hearing from Senator Langford, who, of course, was one of the leads in the Senate, who negotiated this deal? 
Well, Yamish, we're in a very extraordinary situation right now. This would be the most conservative border security and asylum overhaul bill in decades. President Joe Biden, the Democrat, has signed on, and the main obstacle to passing this through Congress is Republicans. This is a 370-page bill, $118 billion, including all that national security aid uh, that is attached to it for Ukraine and for Israel. Where do things stand right now? Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has said there's going to be the first procedural vote on Wednesday, but this thing faces a steep uphill climb to getting to 60 votes, which is what it needs to break a filibuster. A number of Republicans have already come out against it. That includes Steve Daines, a member of the Republican leadership team. Interestingly, and probably not uncoincidentally, he leads the Republican campaign arm, which is trying to use this chaos at the border as, a, as an election issue. Senator James Langford, the lead author of this, has been making the hard sell, arguing that this is a good deal. He's sympathizing with his fellow conservatives who do blame President Biden for uh, the situation at the border. Others can disagree with this, but let's take a listen to what Langford said earlier. It's not just a political crisis, it's a national security crisis, and we should treat it that way. This White House has intentionally opened up our border and released this havoc on all of our cities and communities based on their bad decisions at the beginning. So there are things they can do, but there are also weak areas in the law as well that have been problems for years that need to be fixed that won't get better by an executive action. They'll get better by passing law. Now, I spoke to Langford as well earlier today. He said he was a little bit surprised at how quickly some people came out against this bill, pointing out that they had told him they want days or weeks to, to read it, and yet within minutes or hours of this bill coming out, they were immediately tweeting their opposition. This is election year politics marring uh, a very ambitious effort on immigration. Well, Sahel, I want to stay with you because there's this fascinating part of this story, which is that not only are Republicans mad, but some Democrats are saying they won't support the bill. You have people like Senators Bernie Sanders, Alex Padilla. They're coming out saying that this bill is just not right. Why are there Democrats willing to stick their necks out for this bill when it may not, it may not even have a future? It might be dead in the House. Why would Democrats want to back this? For a few reasons. I think Democrats have seen the politics of immigration. They know it's a huge vulnerability for them, a huge vulnerability for President and Biden. The numbers you just showed are reflected across the board in, in many other polls, Yamish. I think they recognize that the asylum system is overwhelmed and they've accepted that uh, something needs to be done on a, on a policy basis, as well as, you know, of course, the, the political incentive to do it. Is there democratic opposition? Yes. There was always going to be from uh, certain corners of progressives who, you know, believe in a more pro-immigration system, who don't want these restrictions, at least without other items uh, like legalization for dreamers, which is not in this bill. Uh, some members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus have also complained that they were essentially shut out of the negotiations, that it was, you know, leadership allies and uh, Senator Chris Murphy leading this. So there will be uh, opposition from Democrats, but it's a minority. A number of Democrats are coming out uh, in favor of this bill. The Democratic whip count at this moment looks much better than the Republican whip count for this bill. It's still unclear that uh, the number is going to add up to 60. If it's not unclear, of course, that the number is going to add up to 60, what happens to the foreign aid that's part of this deal? Of course, there's money that's supposed to be going to Ukraine, to Israel. What happens to all of that? It's probably not going to pass at all, Yamish. The reason we're in this place is that Republicans had demanded border security provisions as a, as a condition to pass any aid to Ukraine. Now, there's a separate attempt in the House to pass standalone aid to Israel. It's unclear if Republicans can even pass that in the House, but it is not going anywhere, uh, it seems, in the Senate. And the White House has said the president does not support standalone aid to Israel, that he wants uh, the separate provisions for Ukraine, and he wants the supplemental funding uh, and, you know, these policies on the border as well. So that's where we stand right now. Either uh, Ukraine aid is going to ride along with this immigration package, or it's probably not going to pass at all, at least while Republicans control the House. Well, critical reporting. Thank you so much, Sahil, from Capitol Hill. So, Julia, I want to turn to you. You're, of course, our border expert. You know so much more about this topic than anyone else that I see. Um, tell us a little bit about how this bill, if it did pass, how it would impact the southern border. Well, look, it would have an immediate impact impact in the short term at least. What it doesn't do is talk about the root causes of migration, why we're at historic levels, or provide any kind of pathway uh, or semblance of normal life for undocumented migrants, over 11 million of them living in the United States. And that's what we used to talk about. We used to talk about immigration reform. Now the words are border security. So it's focusing on 2,000 miles of border with the U.S. and Mexico. And that's the main piece. It doesn't work on how Mexico would take back all the migrants that the United States would stop accepting if they had those triggers in place to shut down migration at the southern border at 5,000 a day on a daily average or 8,500 a day that would trigger the whole thing. 
all those migrants would have to be sent back into Mexico and they could be overwhelmed and refuse to take them back. And they've admitted, the, D the Department of Homeland Security and the White House have admitted, they don't have a new deal with Mexico for them to start taking back more than they already are. But I mean, one of the most radical ideas that came from this that I'm wondering might be something that could pick up and become a reality in a later law or executive action is this idea of cutting out immigration judges, something I've never heard anyone talk about, but it takes immigration judges out of the game for a lot of these cases so that migrants aren't waiting years for their day in court. They have asylum officers interview them and determine whether or not they stay. It seems kind of no nonsense. I'm sure there are a lot of problems. We've seen some uh, advocates say that maybe they wouldn't get due process, but if you can speed up that process for these migrants so they know very quickly whether or not they get asylum and work authorization or deportation, you drastically cut down on the incentive that smugglers and cartel uh, members use all the time to incentivize people to come to the United States because they think they're going to be able to stay. Those are really big changes. You said some of them seem like they might even improve the process here. But you have someone like Senator Alex Padilla, who's a Democrat from California, who said that this is a, quote, a new version of Trump era policies and will cause even more chaos. Could you compare this bill to what we saw in 2018 when the Republicans were pushing for a border deal? It's actually further to the right than what we saw in 2018, the bill that eventually blew up there. This goes further than that, than what we saw under a Trump administration. Now, it could cause chaos, like I said, if Mexico doesn't take them back. And some of these are ideas from the Trump administration, this whole idea of speeding up the process. Uh, but it doesn't do a lot of what someone like Stephen Miller would do, which is to try to increase punishments for children. They do have carve-outs for unaccompanied migrant children. They do have carve-outs for people who are victims of torture. Uh, and they don't separate kids from their families. And that's that's a big change. <laughs> that is a big change. N not that that was in the bill, but something that Trump did. Certainly. Something yeah. that Trump yeah. did. And Garrett, I mean, Julia just said it, this moves farther to the right, but of course the person that you're following around mm -hmm. a lot these days, former President Trump, he still doesn't like it. So does this essentially kill it? And why is he doing this? Well, he's doing it because he wants to run on it. I mean, Donald Trump has made this abundantly clear, really since the beginning of his political career, but especially even since New Hampshire, when he told a bunch of reporters that he was basically de-emphasizing the economy, that he thinks that's going to be less important to the voting public in, in November uh, of this year than is the border. This is the primary issue that has motivated his base from the jump. It's why he brings up migrant caravans every time there's an election forthcoming. Uh, and, it, you know, as much as Democrats want to be caught trying to address this issue, Donald Trump wants to make sure that this is an issue that he can run on with far more aggressive policies than even anything we were talking about back in 2018, than anything that might be passed now to lower the pressure in some way between now and November. And it's interesting that you're saying sort of what Donald Trump wants. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson has said he's running the show but it seems as though if, if Donald Trump doesn't want this, it's not going to happen. Who's running the show here? And is it really dead because Donald Trump wants it to be dead? Well, it's a combination of factors here. Look, I mean, the, the, minor, the majority in the House is so slim, it's very difficult to pass anything there, as we have seen. I'm not even sure if Donald Trump and Mike Johnson wanted this bill to pass, if they could pass it even then. There's just no room for error in the House. So it's a little bit of an academic conversation. But I do think when it comes to Trump, we saw this throughout his entire presidency, and we're seeing it in his post-presidency now. He's far more effective at killing bills and blocking ideas than he ever was at passing even the things he wanted, like his border bill, which ultimately shut the government down to get a wall back when he was president. Of course, never got it, right? So kind of breaking things, throwing sand in the gears is something he and his movement have always been very effective at, not so much at, you know, sort of prescriptively changing policy and the way that he's talking about doing now as a candidate. What well, you're saying about the way that he's talking about doing it, what does a Trump 2.0 border agenda actually look like? Does, is he getting into details, having covered him, you sometimes mm -hmm. see that they're scant, but is he giving details on what he would do? No, in this case, he has been giving more details, and it's much further to write than what Trump 1.0 included, something like work authorizations for migrants who are here awaiting their uh, amnesty hearings and so forth. That would be off the table altogether. Something like talking about the death penalty for human traffickers as a way to stop people getting across the border. He talks about it in a slightly different context, but it presumably would also apply here. And I think you'd see him working hand-in-glove with Governor Abbott down in Texas, whereas the Biden administration has been fighting what Greg Abbott has been doing with putting razor wire up along the border, buoys with razors floating in the river. These are all things that Donald Trump has embraced. So I would expect to see a lot more of that 
not to mention what he would do with folks already inside the country. He's talked uh, quite openly about having one of the largest, the mass deportation efforts that it's ever been seen. And he continues to talk about trying to end or prescript uh, birthright citizenship in a significant way. There's obviously a number of constitutional questions arising there, but he thinks he can, he can narrow it at least with an executive order he could do on day one. I mean, that's a lot of stuff that he wants to get done that could get done if he gets his way to, to the White House again. So thank you so much, Julia Garrett, uh, for your reporting. And up next, trailing Trump, President Biden's approval rating hits a new low in our latest NBC News poll. And that's just one of the many warning signs for the president. Steve Kornacki will be here to take us through the numbers. Plus, Secretary of State Blinken visits the Middle East as the U.S. vows more retaliatory action after hitting Iranian-linked targets inside Iraq and Syria. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. As we mentioned, our latest NBC News national poll paints a bleak picture for President Biden right now with just nine months to go until Election Day. His job approval is at 37 percent overall. That's the lowest our poll has ever recorded during his presidency. He also trails former President Donald Trump by five points in a hypothetical but increasingly likely rematch. President Biden only trailed by two points in our November poll. NBC Steve Kornacki is at the big board with all the, and all of the things that we need to know about this poll. And NBC News' Mike Benley is in Las Vegas, where he's been following President Biden. So, Steve, I have to come to you and this board. It's pretty brutal when you look at this poll. So tell us a little bit about these numbers. Yeah, I mean, from the president's standpoint, certainly it's concerning to be behind Donald Trump at all, certainly by five points. That's the largest lead Trump's ever had over Biden in our polling. And I think what's more concerning from Biden's standpoint would probably be the overall trajectory of this. And I'm talking over the course of years, because we started polling Biden-Trump matchups back in October of 2019. Our very first poll back then had Biden ahead of Trump by nine points. And you can see all the way, 12 polls in the 2020 election election cycle that we took, Biden led in every single one of them. It never got closer than six. The lead we tracked as high as 14 for Joe Biden. Of course, Biden ended up winning the popular vote by about four and a half points. That was 2019. That was 2020. Now, this is our fourth poll this cycle. Starting you know, last June, we had Biden ahead by four. That already was closer than any poll from 2020. And then from there, it went to a tie in the fall. It went to a slight Trump lead in November. And now, as you say, a Trump lead of five points. So not only is the entire political and polling atmosphere very different from what we saw in 2019 and 2020, even within that, there's a trend here that's developing in our poll where the news is getting worse for Biden from a four point lead to a five point deficit now uh, over the matter of nine months or so. The approval rating has a lot to do with that. You mentioned 37 percent, the lowest we've ever recorded Biden at in our poll, the lowest any president's clocked in at since the end days of the George W. Bush administration back in 07 and 08. And then there's this. This is previous incumbents seeking re-election like Biden is now. Where were they in our poll at this same point, at the start of their re-election year? And you could see a big difference. W, George W. Bush, 54 percent approval. He won re-election in 04. Barack Obama, 49, won re-election. Trump was at 46 at the start of 2020, lost re-election. And here's Biden, nine points under where Trump was. The only two incumbents seeking re-election to have a number this low or even lower. You got to go back to George Bush Sr. in 92, Jimmy Carter in 1980. Those are not good precedents if you're the Biden White House. And if you just look at this by issues, ask folks what's the most important to them on the economy. Trump with a 22-point edge over Biden on securing the border, a 35-point edge. Right now, Trump over Biden on that. And then there's this. The necessary mental and physical health to be president. We were we were checking this a lot in 2020. It was basically a wash back then. 41 said Trump had it. 38 said Biden. Look at this now. 46 percent say Trump has the necessary mental physical health. Only half that number for Joe Biden. And finally, I think this may be the most concerning of all for Biden. It's the simple question of competency and effectiveness. Asking which candidate has the competency and effectiveness to be president in 2020. This is what Biden kind of ran on. And he led Trump when we asked this question in 2020 by almost 10 points. Now Trump has an advantage in our poll of 16 points. Just a complete reversal on that basic question of competency. And Steve, the more you talk, the worse it seemed to get for President Biden. That being said, is there any news in here that would be good things that President Biden could point to? 
Yeah, there are a couple things. I mean, there's the economy, just in terms of people's perceptions of where the economy is going. We have some indications that may be getting less negative, maybe getting more positive. The Biden folks certainly hoping that there'll be a drumbeat of positive economic news this year, and that at some point that'll really attach itself to his approval rating, tick him up there and tick him up in the head-to-head uh, -head with Trump. And then there's also this. Look at some of the weaknesses Biden has in our poll right now. Young voters, they were a big part of his coalition in 2020. We got a 42-40 to tie Biden and Trump. That's not good news for Biden. But the real issue here is there's a lack of enthusiasm and engagement, enthusiasm just to vote at all among this age group in our poll. The Biden folks are hoping that as the election nears, that interest level will rise. And while the young voters do not have generally favorable views of Biden, they also don't have favorable views of Trump. So the Biden folks hope that as young voters get more engaged in this, they'll ultimately decide basically they more want to vote against Trump than they want to vote against Biden. They see an opportunity for growth there. You also look here, the, the Hispanic vote, basically even, Trump ahead by one point. That's something Republicans have been talking up the possibility of. They've got to like that. Among African Americans, this is a solid lead for Joe Biden, 75, 16 percent. But Democrats want to do better than that. They want to keep Trump in single digits here. They want to get this Biden number up, you know, about 10, 15 points further from where it is. So that's where they would see opportunities for growth sort of demographically. Well, Steve, always great to see you at the big board. Thank you so much. You got it. And Mike, Steve walked us through these numbers. Um, it's really interesting when you look at sort of what President Biden is facing and how bad these numbers look for him. What are we hearing from President Biden, of course, as you're out there on the campaign trail with him? Well, Yamiche, of course, the president announced he was running for a second term last April, and his campaign then got to work sort of developing the strategy, building the campaign to execute on that strategy. But it's only in these last few weeks that we have seen President Biden himself engaging in the campaign uh, in a way that speaks to what the, the plan will be this year. It started out with that major speech on democracy, then that rally with Vice President Harris on abortion rights, two important pillars uh, of the messaging this year. And then, of course, the primaries themselves have begun. South Carolina, there was a lot of engagement with black voters. Here in Nevada, talking to black voters, Latino voters, AAPI voters, but it was also interesting, Nevada being highlighted as a battleground state, not just in this primary stage, but in November. And because of that, we heard the president last night here really sharpening his rhetoric about President, uh, former President Trump, specifically on the economy. Take a listen to what the president said here. Trump also said the one president he doesn't want to be like was Herbert Hoover. <laughs> Donald, I got bad news for you, pal. It's too late. <laughs> You're one of only two presidents in American history, you and Herbert Hoover, who left office with fewer jobs than when you took office. You're the reason that Donald Trump is a former president. And you're the reason he'll make Donald Trump a loser again. So you really have seen the president much more willing to spar with his one time and future rival directly uh, as Trump has won his own uh, caucus and primary so far. This is a strategy that's been in the works, but the team in Wilmington running this campaign had wanted to wait for that direct conflict until voters began really realizing that it was Donald Trump likely to be the opponent. They weren't quite ready or didn't want to uh, believe that that was the case, according to the Biden team's internal research. And so now you're seeing a greater willingness for President Biden to take him on head on. Mike, it's really interesting to hear President Biden making almost the exact same argument that he made in 2020, which is Trump will be a disaster. You need to vote for me. How confident is the Biden campaign in that strategy, especially as you were seeing these poll numbers come out that don't look great for President Biden? Yeah, what the Biden team has been telling me is that essentially because the voters have not yet seen Trump as the likely nominee until this point, they were holding their fire on some level. And because of that, it's really that we're starting to see Biden take him on. But what has he been doing up to this point? The, the president has been laying the foundation for the better part of the last five, six months on another issue, the economy. That was done with significant risk, even criticism from fellow Democrats about the Bidenomics messaging. The Biden team thought it was important to lay that foundation on the economy. It's always an important issue in an election. Today, he was spending some time with union workers, another pillar of the strategy for the Biden team. And having established that economic foundation, they believe he can now pivot to that direct messaging with Donald Trump. But there's a lot of, as you heard from the president there, baiting Trump into a fight because they think 
sparring with him, calling him a loser, as he has done now in several public campaign events, also will trigger Trump in a way and lead him to his own worst impulses. It's that kind of Trump that they relish uh, a, a fight against this November. Well, Mike Memoli in Las Vegas, you always have all the latest when it comes to the Biden campaign. So thanks so much for sticking with us. And still to come, White House worries, polling pain, and presidential politics. The panel's up next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. President Biden is trying to convince Americans he's the best man for the job. But as we've been reporting, our latest NBC News poll shows he has his work cut out for him. For more, I'm joined by my panel, Daniela Diaz, congressional reporter for Politico, Rana Epting, Epting executive director for Move On, and Hogan Gidley, former national press secretary for, for Donald Trump's 2020 campaign and a former deputy White House press secretary during the Trump administration. So, Rana, I want to start with you. Um, putting all these issues aside and really thinking about them together, how does the Biden campaign overcome these numbers. We're talking about the worst approval ratings that we've seen in presidential history. How, how does he deal with this? Well, first of all, I mean, they may be not great numbers, but pollings are mere snapshots. And we saw, you know, Steve go over all these numbers over the last year. It is one blip right now. So I just don't want to give too much credit to a poll, which we know are indicators of sentiment, not necessarily indicators of action people actually take. Mm -hmm. So who shows up at the polls is yet to be determined. And we have 10 months. So there, that just is an indicator of the work that the Biden campaign has to do between now and Election Day. Daniela, what's, what's your take on this? As we hear, she's, she's saying basically people haven't voted yet. This is sort of just very, very early. I completely agree. It's still very early on. I covered the 2020 election, and I remember there was a lot of things that changed between now and November. At this time in 2020, uh, considerably, there was a pandemic that was starting. There's a lot of things that could be happening between now and then that could really sway the numbers in either favor, of course, it's not helping Biden that Capitol Hill is kind of in disarray and a lot of his key uh, uh, policies that he wants to pass aren't happening. But, I mean, a lot, a lot of things can change. And, Hogan, on the issue of a lot of things could change, right now the economy is showing signs of strength. Um, what do you make and what are Republicans talking about? Could that possibly help President Biden out with these economic numbers? Right now, people are saying we, we trust former President Trump on this issue. But if the economy keeps getting better, do you think those numbers could, could move in the president's favor? Well, again, I want to agree with both these panelists, too, about the, the length between now and when we start voting. It's a long time, but it is problematic, as Steve pointed out, the fact that for the first time ever, Donald Trump is actually leading in polls, which he didn't do in 2020 at any given point. Of course, the economy is always a big issue. But immigration is overtaken as the number one issue for many reasons, not the least of which is illegal immigrants put a massive strain on these local communities with their school systems, with their health care system, with first responders. Now you're kicking kids out of school and putting illegal immigrants into these uh, schoolhouses, kicking people out of hotels and putting illegal immigrants into these hotels. So it, it, it's part and partial. It works together. A long way to go. But Don, uh, Donald Trump clearly had a strong economy when he was president of the United States. And he also had ra rational and sane border policy. People remember that. We don't have to point back to Reagan and go, look how good it was back in the 80s. This was just a few years ago when people were experiencing some of this record-setting success. All right, I want to ask you, when you think about sort of the messaging here and maybe some Democrats would want to push back on what Hogan is saying, a big place that you could do that is during a Super Bowl interview. President Biden has decided for now the second year in the row not to take part in that interview. What do you make of that decision given sort of the where President Biden finds himself in this moment? Well, first of all, I think most people are going to be tuning into the Super Bowl to see Taylor Swift. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so maybe I thought you were going to say the game, but you're, <laughs> correct, you're correct. I don't know. Taylor Swift. I'm for the first time excited about the Super Bowl. But um, so I'm not sure that's like a poor strategic choice. I don't think that's necessarily the tension. But ultimately, what Biden is going to need to do between now and November is really tell the story and remind voters of the stable um, governance that he's provided this country. And to be honest, I think a lot of folks haven't woken up to the fact that we are in a presidential election cycle. Uh, less, you know, there is not a majority of people that realize that Donald Trump is going to be the eventual Republican nominee and that Joe Biden is going to be and is the Democratic nominee. But, but, 
Yeah, I was going to say, why isn't the Super Bowl, though, a good place to make that case and to explain to people, hey, Donald Trump's coming back and there's a rematch coming. Why is this audience, this huge audience, that, yeah, maybe be looking for, they, maybe they're looking for Taylor Swift, but he, they're also going to be tuning in by the millions, Americans. I, I, by, I mean, I'm not going to... I don't know why he hasn't decided to speak of the Super Bowl, but the fact of the matter is he needs to get out there, he needs to get in the field, he needs to talk to voters, and it is the first week of February, and, and there's, there's time, and they got to start now. And he needs yeah. to talk to press. He's not yeah. even doing an interview ahead of the Super Bowl, which was always a tradition coming from the president, and he's not going to be speaking to anyone directly ahead of that either. Mm. And but, I want to stick with you, Danielle. I mean, what are you hearing, of course, about this border deal House Republicans are already saying it's set on arrival, but we also are hearing from some Democrats that they really want it to pass, but also there are some who are blasting it. What are you hearing? Yamish, we're not super surprised that there's conservatives that don't appreciate this deal, the typical names that we were expecting, like Mike Lee and Rand Paul and Ron Johnson, and then, of course, the very far left members like Bernie Sanders, who are not for this deal. Now, what's surprising is that there are a significant amount of Senate Republicans that are coming out and trickling against this one by one, namely, you know, in the last two hours, Senator Katie Britt came out out against this, someone that is in McConnell's leadership, it's going to be really, really difficult for Senate leadership, both McConnell and Schumer, to get this across the finish line when they have a vote on Wednesday. You know, they've been working on this for four months. It was Senate Republicans that decided to link Ukraine, Israel, and border. And now it's looking like it could potentially be doomed. Um, Hogan, I want to ask you about another issue, and that is former President Trump's legal problems. Um, we are seeing in polls that, at least for the Republicans, this isn't an issue for Republican voters. But as we move to the general, is there any concern amongst the people that you are, I'm sure, constantly in touch with that this could hurt President Trump in the general? Well, look, if you're asking me whether or not I'd rather have a candidate who didn't face legal troubles or did, I'd obviously want one who didn't. However, Donald Trump has done a pretty good job to this point using those attacks on him legally as some type of uh, uh, cudgel to, to, to uh, not just expose the problems he views coming out of the uh, three-letter agencies and the federal government weaponized against several people, uh, not, not the least of which him. Uh -huh. But that's a big issue for Republican voters, and I do think a vast majority of the, the middle of the country, when they start to see kind of the ramifications of these judicial rulings in a lot of ways, you saw these pro-life uh, supporters get thrown in jail for more than a decade, stuff like that starts to come out and people realize, wait a minute, I don't like the fact that the federal government is coming after American citizens for simply uh, exercising their right to free speech. Donald Trump can be the tip of that spear. He can come out and use that to his advantage politically. So far, he's done so, and I expect him to continue need to try. And Hogan, I want to play some sound from you from Speaker Mike Johnson, who insists that Donald Trump is not calling the shots. Let's, let's listen to that. Is Donald Trump calling the shots here, Mr. Speaker? Of course not. He's not calling the shots. I am calling the shots for the House. That's our responsibility. And I have been saying this far longer than President Trump has. I have been saying what the requirements are to fix the problem. I don't care if they call the legislation H.R. 2 or not. What we're saying is you have to stem the flow. Hogan, is Donald Trump calling the shots here? And why won't Speaker Johnson say that if that is the case? Well, he said he calls the shots. I think that's pretty clear. But to pretend as though... This is, of course, on the border deal, I should well, say. Well, yeah, but he's saying, I call the shots, I'm the Speaker of the House, which makes sense. But to pretend as though Joe Biden doesn't call Democrats and work with them on certain issues and Donald Trump doesn't call Republicans to say, I don't like this particular bill, is silly. Everyone knows how this works. The fact is, Donald Trump had sane, rational border policy. We didn't see spikes in human trafficking, child smuggling, drugs pouring into our country now killing a vast majority is the, uh, the cause for deaths among 18 to 45 year olds in this country. So he can point to that as saying, look, with uh, Joe Biden at the helm, you see chaos at the border. You see chaos around the globe. You see chaos in cities with crime spiking in the economy, et cetera. It wasn't like that with me. So these two men have a unique situation where they're both running as one sitting president and one former president saying, we're comparing our records, not as governor, not as senator, but as presidents. It's really a fascinating time. We have time. a few seconds left, but I want to get, get your reaction to that. I just completely disagree with that. It's not true. Donald Trump and the Republicans had some of the most cruel and inhumane immigration policies at the border. I remember... Uh, the Those are the laws on the books.
if you don't want them to, if you don't want to enforce those laws on the books, then change the laws. How and Congress they're hasn't done it. and whether you do it in a cruel way at the border does matter who's well, in, the, in the Oval Office. It is. We, I would love to have more time, but we have to stop there. Thank you so much to Daniela, to Rana, to Hogan. Thank you so much. And next, we'll take you live to Bahrain, where we are on the ground following the U.S. military's escalation in the Middle East. Our Pentagon correspondent, Courtney Cuby, has the latest from the region. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We continue to learn more about the U.S. retaliatory strikes in Syria and Iraq late last week. The Pentagon says it struck seven facilities, including more than 85 targets that Iranian forces and Iran-backed militia used to attack U.S. forces. The damage assessment remains ongoing. And there are no indications that any Iranians were killed in the strikes. On yesterday's Meet the Press, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan would not rule out the potential for strikes inside Iran. And today, the Pentagon said that last week's military action was just the start of the U.S. response. This is the start of our response, and there will be additional actions taken to hold the IRGC and affiliated militias accountable for their attacks on U.S. and coalition forces. We do not seek conflict in the Middle East or anywhere else, but attacks on American forces will not be tolerated, and we will continue to take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our forces, and our interests. It comes as the U.S. and the U.K. conducted joint strikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen. The militant group condemned the attack, saying that the strike will not go unanswered. While these strikes are separate from the U.S. retaliatory response, it highlights the mounting tension throughout the region. Joining me now is Courtney Cuby in Bahrain, in Bahrain who was aboard the USS Eisenhower as it conducted deterrence operations in the region. So thank you so much for being here. So let's start with these strikes in Iraq and Syria. What was the initial reaction in the region to the U.S. action there? So when the, the U.S. has taken these sorts of actions in Iraq, there has been pretty consistent condemnation of them by the government in Baghdad. But the majority of the time, they, they even will make some threats saying that they're going to kick the United States out of Iraq and out of the region. But most of the time, the reality is it's really more for domestic consumption and nothing is, is at this point still changing about the U.S. presence in Iraq or in Syria. Uh, but there were at least 85 targets that were struck. That was a huge huge undertaking by the U.S. military to, to go after all of those locations. And it's exactly the kind of thing that you would expect to hear, Yamish. It's, it's uh, military capabilities by some of these uh, Iranian-backed militia groups with the goal of trying to keep them uh, from carrying out future attacks because either they they don't have enough munitions, the U.S. has already blown them up, or they may be deterred by this large set of airstrikes and may not continue to carry out these strikes. And of course, this all comes after three, three U.S. soldiers were killed in a drone attack on a base just on the border with Jordan and Syria a little over a week ago. The retaliation, we're told, and these retaliatory strikes are going to continue, though, Yamish. They're going to continue. Um, and you, though, were embedded on the USS Eisenhower as it conducts deterrence operations in the Red Sea. Have those strikes been effective in the way that the U.S. would have hoped in deterring the, Uthi the Houthis in Yemen? So it's also, that's also been pretty consistent that after the U.S. carries out strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen, the Houthis have continued to fire back. But I, I will say it seems to be on a smaller and smaller scale. So, for instance, on uh, Sunday, the attacks or the strikes by the U.S. and the British military were Saturday night. On Sunday, the Houthis tried to attack um, a, another commercial ship in the region. The U.S. were able to knock down the projectile. And then the U.S. carried out another set of airstrikes, taking out some launchers. So... We've been asking that same question on the, the USS Eisenhower. Individuals who were directly involved in those strikes believe it was a success, but they acknowledge that striking at their, their um, facilities where they store in drones, launchers where they launch off these very dangerous ballistic missiles, those sorts of military targets, yes, it could degrade their capability to continue to, to target ships in the Red Sea and in the Gulf of Aden, but it's not going to necessarily stop them at this point, Yamish. And you've just described a lot of military activity in the region. How concerned are officials about the potential for miscalculations? That has been a completely consistent concern. And, you know, one of the officials who we spoke with, a, a U.S. Navy officer, 
uh, was familiar with. He was directly involved in that attack that the Houthis shot up at U.S. Navy helicopters a few weeks ago. You may remember it. The U.S. responded from those helicopters by sinking several Houthi boats. There were upwards of 10 Houthi militants who were reportedly killed in that. One of the officials I spoke with said, look, this is an escalation, and it's, it, we have to adapt to how the Houthis continue to adapt their targets. Another new capability that they've shown just in recent weeks is what the military calls an unmanned surface vessel. Basically, it's a drone that rather than flying in the air, is on sea. They've now tried it several different occasions to send these explosive packed sea drones towards a U.S. ship or excuse me, towards a ship in the Red Sea, and the U.S. has been able to intercept them so far. But even as they continue to carry out these strikes, to ha have this deterrence presence mission throughout the Red Sea and into the Gulf of Aden, the Houthis really remain defiant here still, Yamish. Courtney Cuby in Bahrain doing exclusive and critical reporting for us. Thank you. Thanks. For more on the U.S. strikes in Iraq and in Syria, I'm joined now by retired Admiral James Stavridis, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander and NBC News Chief International Analyst, and Bilal Saab, Senior Fellow at the Middle East Institute. So, Admiral, I want to start with you. What was your reaction to these initial retaliatory strikes, and did they go far enough? I think they did go far enough, Yamish, uh, for where we are right now. What the administration hopes to do is kind of control this ladder of vertical escalation. So they started a couple of months ago uh, with individual strikes going back against the place a drone might have come from. That clearly was not having sufficient effect. Then the Red Sea kind of kicked in. So now what we're seeing in the wake of the deaths of three American servicemen and women is a larger campaign-like series of strikes, really round numbers, about 100 targets up north in Iraq and Syria and about 50 in and around the Red Sea. So it's a volume increase, and it has also opened up to go after Iranian Revolutionary Guard who are embedded in some cases with these proxies. So I think these strikes are calibrated. Let's see what happens over the next week or so. I think they'll continue unless we see a cessation. At the end of all that, the administration will have a tough choice. If this does not have the desired effect, then you have to start thinking about going after targets in Iran. That's going to be very challenging in a number of ways. And Bilal, I mean, as, as Ed, we're talking about these being collab calibrated and really being very strategic how what do you make of the locations of these strikes are they strategically significant when you look at the locations um, of all of these strikes so really sitting here in washington behind my desk i mean typically after such strikes you do what we call and i'm sure jim knows about this you do a um uh, battle damage assessment, the fancy words for, which is basically assess the efficacy of the strikes. Uh, and given that these have been pretty extensive, it might take a little bit of time to figure out really what we hit and how strategic and how effective those are. I'm pretty confident that the U.S. military and CENTCOM in specific has done those things. I'm not sure if they will release them or they'll release parts of them, but it's, I think, premature to say if they've been strategic or significant. I agree with Jim, this is going to have to be a campaign. This is a process. I don't think uh, we're going to be anytime soon significantly degrading the capabilities of the Houthis, especially in the absence of a parallel effort to uh, deny them the supplies. It's one thing to actually degrade the existing capabilities of the Houthis, another altogether to cut off their supply lines, and that's going to require a whole lot more than U.S. air power. You need an interdiction regime at sea that goes into um, cutting off the supply lines of the Houthis, which are not insignificant. As you say that, um, Admiral, we're, I wanted to ask you about something that's playing out in Washington, D.C. There's some back and forth over whether the U.S. gave Iraq a heads up about these, about these retaliatory strikes. Uh, the White House is now walking back what it said about pre-notification. How significant is that? And what does that mean for our relationship with Iraq if we're, there's this back and forth going on at the White House? Well, it's always complicated when you uh, are going to launch a strike and you are going to move uh, fighter aircraft or even cruise missiles or drones over the airspace of a sovereign nation. It's a judgment call. Ideally, you would give notice, particularly with Iraq. 
a nation with whom we have good relations and have been cooperating. Unfortunately, the flip side of that is there are elements in the Iraqi government that would put it on a fast pipeline uh, directly to some of these militias. So uh, it's very complicated set of calculi to make that. I do want to pick up on a point Bilal made a moment ago uh, about an at-sea interdiction. That is correct. It is complicated. Um, there, we would have to try and bring more of our allies into this because you wouldn't want to try and do that just with the U.S. I've tried to do those blockades and interdictions. They're complicated and very worship intention, should we say. Mm. And but I want to ask you about something else that happened last night. We saw a drone attack on a base that houses U.S. troops in Syria. Given that, did the U.S. strikes really do anything to, to restore deterrence in the region because we saw that? Yeah, obviously not the first time we see such uh, strikes against U.S. personnel in Syria. And they're, you know, I would say, in a pretty vulnerable position there. Obviously, our top priority over there is uh, force protection. I don't think we have a whole lot more leeway, frankly, there than what we have with the Houthis, given the very challenges that Jim uh, described, which are very accurate. The fact that we have a very uh, I would say challenging political relationship with uh, Baghdad, the political sensitivities that the Iraqi government has to deal with. In Syria, it's more of an issue of, frankly, resources. And whenever you need more resources, therefore, you're going to have to bring them somewhere else. And that somewhere else, if it is a priority theater for the United States, and it's going to be really challenging a case to make, be they from the European theater or the Indo-Pacific theater. So are they going to deter them? No, I don't think so, frankly. But the best thing we could do to try to achieve that effect is to continuously degrade the capabilities. Therefore, the effects of those strikes become a little bit more muted. This is what we call deterrence by punishment. Interesting. Deterrence by punishment. And Admiral, um, officials have told us that the U.S. response could last weeks. So looking into the future, what do you expect here? And how soon do we think that we could see even more kinetic strikes? Um, I think you'll see more kinetic strikes in a day or so, assuming the attacks don't uh, simply stop. And I don't think they will. Uh, this will have to go a couple of rounds. And then I think it'll probably be at least seven to 10 days of additional strikes. Um, we, we need to do two things here. Create deterrence in the minds of the mullahs in Tehran. That's very hard to measure, let's face it. But we need to, to Bilal's point, we need to degrade the actual capabilities, the thing in the middle that we've been discussing, cutting off the supply chains is going to be crucial to making this work over the longer term. Boy, critical conversation. Thank you so much, Admiral, and thank you so much, Bilal, for sharing your thoughts. You bet. It's good to be with both of you. Thank you. Next, Secretary Antony Blinken is back in the Mideast with a potential hostage deal still in the works. We're live in Tel Aviv after the break. Welcome back. Today, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Saudi Arabia for his fifth visit to the region since the deadly October 7th attack on Israel. He began his latest tour of the region with a meeting with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. According to a State Department readout, the two leaders discussed the humanitarian situation in Gaza, as well as the need for lasting peace and security for both Israelis and Palestinians. It comes as the U.S., Egypt, and Qatar try to broker a new deal to pause the fighting in exchange for a release of the the remaining hostages inside Gaza. Joining me now is Raf Sanchez. He is in Tel Aviv. So thank you so much for being here. What are the expectations for this latest trip to the region by the Secretary of State? So, Yamish, the secretary meeting for about two hours with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and as well as the things you mentioned in that readout, the Crown Prince is potentially going to be a very influential figure when it comes to who's paying to rebuild Gaza on the other side of this war. I was in Gaza over the weekend with Israeli forces. It is hard to overstate the scale of the devastation. Neighborhood after neighborhood in ruins, according to one analysis, more than half of all of the buildings in Gaza, either partially or completely destroyed at this point, four months into the war. In terms of the expectations, the priorities for the secretary's trip, number one, is preventing further escalation with Iran, as you were just talking about. 
the U.S. striking Iranian facilities in both Syria and Iraq, not killing Iranian operatives themselves. So far, Iran not talking in terms of major retaliation. And the other big priority is trying to get this deal to pause the fighting in Gaza, get more humanitarian aid to Palestinian civilians, and free some of those hostages over the line. Yamish. And you just talked about the scale of the devastation. What's the latest on where Israel stands about a potential ceasefire deal? So there was this framework hammered out in Paris about 10 days ago at this meeting of spy chiefs, including the CIA director, Bill Burns. We are still waiting to see whether that framework can be converted into an agreement and whether Hamas and Israel can both say yes to it or not. At this point, the two sides remain very far apart. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is saying he is not prepared to end the war as part of an agreement, and he is not prepared to release thousands of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails, including some who have been convicted of terrorism offenses. Hamas is saying both of those are key demands for them. So as you said, the U.S. and Qatar are trying to close the gaps and see if they can get this deal over the line. Amish. And, and quickly, is there any concern that any deal could have been upended by the U.S. retaliatory strikes in the region? So at this point, no sign that American strikes in eastern Syria, western Iraq are going to have a major impact on talks between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. One wild card here is if somehow Hezbollah, the powerful Iranian-backed militant group that dominates southern Lebanon, got into the fight, that could upend the whole situation. Yamish. Yeah, well, Raf Sanchez, thank you so much from Tel Aviv. And thank you for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow for more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues right now with Hallie Jackson. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.